fact that they were able to get together and share in God's Word and God's worship with God's people, that they probably don't pay any attention to that at all. But we're so spoiled. Amen. we got to have everything just right. Amen. In order to be able to worship the Lord. we got to have the right song leader. Listen, I went to a church for years where unless it's the right beat, they couldn't shout. Amen. Got to be the right song leader. Got to be the right musicians. Oh, we better learn to shout. We better learn to worship the Lord without all of that because there may come a time when we're like these people over here. We're trying to find somewhere to hide, to get together and to sneak around and to, to gather together in the name of Jesus because they're putting people to death who they find out they're doing it. Amen? Hallelujah. So it better not take something special to turn your crank other than Jesus. Hallelujah. He's enough. Amen? We've been talking, actually I think we skipped a Sunday or so with this, but Ephesians, the second chapter and the first verse, it's not really what we're going to preach on this morning, but it goes along, what we're going to talk about this morning goes along with what we've been talking about some. You know, we talked about how we used to be and how we're supposed to be now. Paul talking in the book of Ephesians starts out in the first verse by saying this. Ephesians 2 and 1 says, And you hath been quickened, and I think you hath he quickened, and I think we, we left this out, this verse out when, we, when we've been doing the preaching on this, but and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Wherein in times past you walked according to the course of this world. Now y'all remember that? Y'all remember us talking about that for a couple of Sundays in a row? How that Paul's talking to saved, born again people here and he's talking to them saying, do you remember how you used to walk? You're not supposed to walk that way anymore. Amen? Amen. He said, wherein in times past you walked according to the course of the world According to the prince of the power of the air, now we know that to be Satan, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. What Paul was saying and what we've learned, and I'm not going to hit hard on it this morning because we already know this. If you don't, you can get the CDs. But we know that we used to walk this way. Used to, our will controlled us. It ain't supposed to no more. Amen? Our emotions controlled us. They're not supposed to anymore. There used to be a time when we walked, as it says here, the children of disobedience, the children of wrath. We used to walk according to those things. And we tied that into forgiveness. Amen. How that we must forgive others. How used to that our way of thinking was an eye for an eye. And if Sister Cindy did me wrong, I'll get her back if it's the last thing I'll do. That used to be the way we used to think. We ain't supposed to think that way anymore. Amen. I told you before, the world can understand an eye for an eye. The devil can understand an eye for an eye, but he can't understand forgiveness. Hallelujah. So Paul's telling us, you used to be this way. You used to walk according to the course of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Then he says, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh. Now we talked about how our conversation is not supposed to be the same. Amen. Amen. I ain't going to hit on that too hard this morning. Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. Now that's what I want to talk about this morning. I want to talk about losing your mind. Amen. I posted on the internet that our sermon this morning was going to be, Have you lost your mind? And somebody, you know, some of the comments I was getting, I thought, well, they're not, they're, they're probably, they're, they're looking forward to hearing it, but they're probably not Gonna, you know, they're probably going to be a little bit surprised because it's probably not the way they're thinking. Because see, it would be a good thing if we could lose our mind this morning. Amen? And I'll prove that to you here in a minute. He said, according to the lust of the flesh and of the mind, and we're, we're by nature the children of wrath even as others. So this change that took place is not just you start wearing a different kind of wardrobe. Not that the only, listen, if the only change that took place is you started going to church once a week, something's wrong, amen? There should be, Paul said, all things pass away and all things become new. There's a change that takes place in the heart and the life of a believer whenever he is born again. Somebody said, well, when you're born again, if you were fat when you was a sinner, you'll be fat when you're born again. No, that's true. Except for the fact we're not talking about physical ailments or physical things that we got. But we're talking about a spiritual change that works its way out on the outside of us so that others can see the change that Jesus has made in us. And Paul is teaching us here that this thing is going to go all the way even to the mind. 
Even your mindset will change. And it has to. I'll show you in a minute in Scripture. Your mindset has to change. Because your carnal mind cannot walk by faith. Your carnal mind is like Lot. When he looked towards Sodom. And he saw that it was well watered. That it was like the garden of the Lord. That it was like Egypt. And his carnal mind took him to Sodom. And you see where his carnal mind wound up taking him in the end. Amen. The Bible says there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, and the end thereof is death. That's the way of your mind. That is the way of your will. That is the way your carnal mind works. Your carnal mind is like Thomas. I'll see it. I'll believe it whenever I see it. Amen. If I can see it, then I'll believe it. Otherwise, I won't. But there is a spiritual mind that I want to talk about this morning. I want to talk this morning about losing our mind and having the mind of Christ. I want to talk about losing our nature and having the nature of God. I want to talk about losing our desires and having the desires of God. Amen? Go with me this morning to Philippians, the second chapter. Philippians, the second chapter, beginning of the first verse. It'd be good for us this morning if we could lose our mind. We ought to pray today. After you hear this sermon today, you ought to start praying this week, Lord, help me lose my mind. Amen? Help me lose my desire. Oh, I wish I could get the church world to lose their mind. Hallelujah. And get a hold of the mind of Christ. Then I wouldn't have to send out no letters for offerings. Amen. Then I wouldn't have to send out no emails asking people to help us to take the gospel around the globe. Because once you have the mind of Christ, then the Great Commission becomes a goal of yours to be obedient to His Word, to take the gospel. And it's more important to you than direct TV. Amen. It's more important to you than your TV guide subscription that you subscribe to. Amen. Can't afford to pay my tithes because my satellite bill. So how what time do you get rid of your satellite? Amen. If I had to take my tithe money and pay my cable bill, I'd have not cut off my cable. That don't get me very popular, but I'm talking about having the mind of Christ. Amen. Do you think Jesus would have set himself up in a nice apartment with cable TV and air conditioning and let the world go to hell? No, that's why He said the Son of Man that has nowhere to lay His head. Amen? Because He didn't come with His mind set on the financial things of the world. He didn't come with a religious mind. He didn't come with a political mind. He came with a mind to help others. To He said He came to seek and to save that which was lost. Listen to what it says over in Philippians. This is good if you can get hold of it. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ... If any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercy, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Now what mind is he talking about? He's not talking about the mind of the world. The Bible says, and I'll give you the Scripture in a minute, but the Scott says to be carnally minded is death. Amen? Carnal, the carnal mind is enmity with God. He goes on to say, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. Now see, that's the way your old mind works. Your old mind feeds off strife sometimes. You ever met people who just were not satisfied unless there was some kind of stink being stirred? Yeah, there's a lot of that. Amen? Somebody got to have some drama going or they ain't happy. Their life must, it's like their life is boring without them stirring up some kind of trouble some way or another. Amen? I like what the old folks used to say. The more you stir it, the worse it stinks. Amen? But that's the way our old carnal mind is. But I want you to lose your mind. And God wants us to lose our mind today. And I'll prove it to you. Look not every man on his own things. Now see, that's the way our mind is. Our old carnal mind is selfish, Brother Sleeves. It's selfish. Amen? Our carnal, our carnal mind does not want to share. It, oh, it might give you something after it's had the best. Amen? Whatever the slim pickings is that's left, you might get that. But our carnal mind is selfish. But Paul's not teaching us about the carnal mind here. He's talking to us about having the mind of Christ. He says, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Now he ain't talking about poking and prying in somebody's business. He's talking about caring for one another. 
He's talking about loving one another. He's talking about being concerned for one another. He goes on to make this statement. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. You hear that? He took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of even though this man was God. Amen? Now I know that may offend some of my Trinity brethren out there and I don't mean to. But Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. Amen? He was God in the flesh. The Bible says He was the Word, which was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And this God-man, this man that was 100% man and 100% God, this man who, if anyone could have rose up and said, I don't deserve this, certainly Jesus could have said that. Amen? But instead, the Bible says, He takes on the form of a servant. Do you remember when he gathered together with the disciples there in the room and they were all sitting around and Jesus got up and he filled a basin with water and his disciples were sitting around wondering what in the world is this man, what is our Lord doing? Amen? What is it? They called Him Lord. They called Him Master. They followed Him. They were His disciples. When they saw Him get up from the table and begin to fill the water basin full of water, they thought, well, you know, He's going to have one of us to wash His feet. Surely, that's what's going to take place. No, but they see this King of glory, this King of kings, this Lord of lords, this Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. They see Him, Brother Scott, take off His clothes and lay them aside and put the towel around his waist and begin to bend down in front of the disciples and to begin to wash their dirty feet. Can you imagine the thoughts that were going through their mind? But see, we're talking about the mind of Christ. See, the carnal mind would have you wash my feet. The, the mind of Christ would say, take off your shoes so I can wash your feet. Amen. The, the carnal mind would have you minister to me. The mind of Christ would have me minister to you. Hallelujah. So he he disrobes, he puts on the towel, he bends down there and he begins to wash their feet and here are these men and they're looking at this man and you know what Peter thought about him? When he asked Peter, he said, who am I, Peter? He said, you're Christ. You're the Son of the living God. You're the Christ. So Peter, when he got to him, Peter said, uh-uh, uh-uh, no, no. You ain't going to wash my feet. And Jesus said, if you don't let me wash your feet, you can't have no part of me. And Jesus said, I'll wash my feet and wash my head. Amen. Just wash me all over then. Because if it means I can't have part of you, then I'll do it. But Jesus, this, man, this God in the flesh, the man they called Master, the man they called Lord, kneels down in front of them. Can you see the vast contrast between that mindset and the mindset that you see in most of the religious world today? No one's fighting over the low road. Amen. There is no strife going on over the place of humility. No, it's all, everybody's fighting over let me be number one. Amen. Let me be number one. When Jesus, who was God in the flesh, made Himself of no <laughs> reputation, and He put on the form of a servant, and He humbled Himself, and became obedient unto death. Even the death of the cross. We're talking about losing your mind this morning. Amen? Because your mind is like the devil's mind before you were saved. Because the Bible says you walked according to what? The prince of the power of the air or something along those lines. You know how his mind thought. I will be like God. I will ascend above the Most High. I will be like Him. He really wanted to be greater than him. Pride had swelled up into his own carnal mind and he thought, I'm going to be like God. Oh, no, you ain't either. Amen? And we got the same thing happening today. You're a God. I'm a God. We're all little gods. No, 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 we ain't. Amen? He's still God and we still ain't. But he wants us to have the mindset that Christ had. And if we could have that mindset, then we'd have no trouble putting God first.
Then we'd have no trouble paying our tithe. Then we'd have no trouble giving in the offering. Then we'd have no trouble being faithful to the house of God. Then we'd have no trouble supporting the ministry or doing the work or getting out and witnessing. Then we'd have no trouble witnessing and telling people about Jesus when we cross their paths out on the street or when we're in the, in the store and they begin to tell us how bad they were felt and how everything that was going wrong in their life. We would have no problem at all saying, hey, I got the answer you need. The answer is Jesus. We'd have no problem then forsaking everything else and putting God first and picking up the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, and going forth to a lost and dying world and letting our light shine once we had the mind of Christ. Because He said, well, I'm here. I'm the light of the world. Then He turns to His disciples because He knows He's not going to be here long. And He says, you are the light. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid." Let your light shine before men so that they will see your works and they will glorify your Father which is in heaven. You cannot allow this. This light will not shine if you allow your carnal mind to have its way. We must take upon ourselves. We must seek for. We must, we must pray for the mind of Christ in all matters in our life because your carnal mind will lead you to death. Amen? What kind of mind is Paul telling us to have? And we can look at the life of Jesus to find, he said, let this mind that was in Christ Jesus be also in you. Now let me ask you a question today. Did Jesus have a religious mind? Oh, I think you could ask the Pharisees today and they'd say, no, he wasn't very religious. Amen? A man that picks up a whip and goes into the temple and runs out the money changers. He wasn't very politically correct. Amen? So what kind of mind did he have? He had the kind of mind that whenever he saw people that were hurting, he was moved with compassion. He had the kind of mind, Brother Sleeves, that whenever he saw blind Bartimaeus, he was moved with compassion. He felt love for those that were unlovable for most people. Amen? For the beggars and for the, the ones that were blind and the ones that were lame and the ones that were hauled and the, one, the man that was impotent there at the pool of Bethesda. He had, he had compassion on these people. So it doesn't take very long to find out what kind of mind rules most Christians' life whenever we don't have time to slow down and do anything for anybody except ourselves. That's not the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ would stop what He's doing and go through enemy territory just to win a woman that was going to come to the well and get some water. He said, I must need to get... Now there was another way to get to where He was going without going through Samaria. And the Samaritans didn't like the Jews. Amen? Still don't. But Jesus said, I'm going to have to go through here. I must needs. So he goes through there. He sits down on a well and he waits for the woman to come. He knew she was coming. Amen? <laughs> and the mind of Christ, even though, it, even though it, was, it was a place of danger, he went there to save this woman's soul. Amen? I heard somebody say, it hadn't been too long ago, I was talking to a preacher, I'll leave him nameless. But he made a statement that kind of struck me strange. I didn't say nothing to him about it. I should have, I guess. Didn't even think about it a whole lot until after he walked away from me. But we were talking about radio, and we were talking about you know him, his program and getting it out there and doing whatever. He was talking about the potential of any feedback or any finances. He acted like, well, you know, if, this is his words, not mine. He said, if I do this, I guess I'll just have to do it for Jesus instead of any finances. And I thought, well, if you do it for any other reason, you'd be doing it for the wrong thing anyway. Amen? There's an odd statement right there. Wow, wouldn't it be something if we could just do something for Jesus and not have to worry about any us getting anything in return? Amen? See, the mind of Christ is like that. The mind of Christ don't look at a situation and decide, well, what am I going to get out of this? How's this going to benefit me? Amen? No, it's your carnal mind that is enmity with God and it will lead you to death if you will allow it to rule your life. Amen? But the mind of Christ, you know what the mind of Christ says? The mind of Christ says, I know they're going to kill me. I know they're going to spit on me. I know they're going to beat me. I knew all this before I came. But I still love them. I still will help them even though I know they have no intention whatsoever of helping me. Unselfish. That's the kind of mind that Christ had. He was not a political man. He was not a religious man. He was not a selfish man. 
He did not preach the self-centered gospel that you see on television this morning. He did not preach you can be a better you by the power of positive thinking. Amen. He preached not the power of positive thinking, but the power of God. Amen. And he brought forth that through his word and through his actions and through his life. He showed us the mind of Christ. And all of this he did without compromise. Now there's a strange thought this morning. Because most of the church world will say, but without compromise, Brother Billy, we won't be very popular. Really? What did Jesus tell His disciples? He said, they'll deliver you up to be killed for my name's sake. They'll hate you. He might have said, you'll be hated of all nations for my name's sake. But wait a minute. That's why we have the contemporary music. That's why we have the drama team. That's why we have the tongue talking class and the dance class. That's why we have the rock band that's supposed to be Christian come in on Saturday nights and they, they look like Def Leppard or something to minister to our kids, to draw the kids in. That's why we have to compromise. Oh, if you do, you'll sell your soul to the devil because you will be giving in to the mind of carnality instead of the mind of Christ. Jesus never one time compromised his stand. Without compromise, we won't have a big crowd. Well, neither did he. Mm -hmm. Brother Willie, what about Brother Billy? What about the what about the five thousand? Well, as long as he was giving out bread, sure. Yeah. Amen. Mm -hmm. You don't have any trouble getting people lined up for the free cheese. Mm -hmm. Amen. As long as you're giving it away, they'll show up. But how many people did he have when he was hanging on the cross and giving up the last breath that he had in his body? One disciple. Yeah. One disciple out of all of them that had followed him, out of all of the out of the thousands that he fed there on the mountain, brother Scott, one disciple stands at the foot of the cross, and that's John the Beloved, mm -hmm. seeking after the mind of Christ. Mm -hmm. Amen. You see, that's really what David was after. He was a man that sought after God's heart. He was really after the mind, because that's really what it is. You know, your heart's just. But your mind, that's where your intellect's at. That's where your will's at. That's where your thinking's at. That's where your decision making's at. And David, if he was here this morning, if we could have him as a special speaker this morning, he would tell you what the carnal mind is and where it leads you. Because it was the carnal mind that caused him to look on Bathsheba and not turn away. Amen? It's one thing to happen along and, oh my goodness, there's a naked woman. It's another thing you say, oh my goodness, she's naked. And keep looking. And keep looking. And then decide you want her. See, all that's carnal mind. All of that is enmity with God. All of that is certainly has nothing to do with the mind of Christ. We need some people to lose their mind this morning, amen? Then we might talk different. Then we might walk different. Have you ever heard somebody say, you know, that person just lost their mind. Why? Because they were acting different than everybody else. If we get enough, when's the last time somebody looked at you and said, you're just too religious? You just got too much of that Jesus. They said about me when I was 16 years old and I was pumping gas. Somewhere along those, maybe 17 years old, I was pumping gas. Somebody told my brother-in-law who I was working for at the time, he said, oh, he'll get over it. <laughs> I was taking my Bible with me to work, amen. I was reading it when I had a chance. I was telling everybody about Jesus, amen. Hallelujah. And when somebody told my brother-in-law, said, he'll get over it. ha. <laughs> Hallelujah, what is this? 30 years down the road and I still ain't over it. Hallelujah. Hope I don't ever get over it. I want to lose my mind. I don't want to have the same thoughts. I don't want to have that old strife and that wrath that swells up inside of me when somebody does me wrong. I don't want to have the carnal mind that's enmity with God. I want to have the mind of Christ that loves my enemy, that prays for those that despitefully use me, that walks in the Word and that speaks with the Spirit and that my words will be spirit and life and not death to the lives of those that I speak. Speak. I want to have the mind of Christ. Amen. How long has it been? Or have you ever got before God on your face and said, Lord, give me your mind and take my old carnal mind away? Take my old... you know there used to be a saying. People would say about Christians, you're too heavenly minded to be any earthly good. Well, I got a new saying for the church as I see it today. They're too earthly minded to be any heavenly good. They're too caught up in the things of the world to be able to do anything for the kingdom of God. They're too busy making money. They're too busy with their own little cliques and their own religion and their own sect and all the things that they do to care about a world that's lost and undone without God. God, give us your mind today. A mind for the lost and the dying. The mind of Christ. 
Help us to be more humble. My goodness. I don't want to run with the big dogs. Amen. You know, you get all these dogs out here and they're all running and they're all chasing after, you know, a coon or whatever it is they're chasing after. And dogs even fight in order to get a hold of the prize that they're after. That's the way preachers are today. They all fight for the top spot. When Jesus came, He didn't have to fight nobody because there wasn't nobody wanting the position He was taking. The position of a servant. The place of humility. You won't find any competition there, Brother Sleeves. Because everybody's fighting for the top dog. Everybody wants to be number one. Everybody wants to be number one. That's the way your carnal mind thinks. Amen. Listen to this night I heard up. I ain't never going to get through. Oh, my, my, my. Without compromise, He did all of these things. And he never called us to be popular in the first place. Amen. He never preached the power of positive thinking. He taught and showed the power of God and the power of love and the power of forgiveness and the power of His Word. 1 Corinthians 2 and 9. Go over there with me. So you can't understand the things of God without the mind of Christ. Because your carnal mind cannot grasp the things. That's why, that's why the church will grab a hold of anything that's easy to read as long as it has Holy Bible on the spine of it. Because the church world too lazy to study. They want everything right there. Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. They don't want to have to look at it and say, Lord, reveal this to me. They don't want the Scripture, Brother Lisa says, study to show yourself approved a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Amen? <clears throat> Rightly dividing the Word. They don't want that part of it. They want Jack and Jill went up the hill. They want Dr. Seuss. You know, will you eat green eggs and ham with a mouse or in a house and a boat with a goat all of that. They want something easy to grasp. They don't want to use the mind of Christ to be able to understand anything. They want their carnal mind to be able to grasp the things of God and it can't. Your mind can't understand how that a man can spit in dirt and make mud and rub it in a blind man's eyes and tell him to go wash and he came back sin. Your carnal mind can't grasp that all, but your spiritual mind can. The mind of Christ can understand it. The mind of Christ believes that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hallelujah. The mind of Christ can understand the things of the Word. Hallelujah. We need to seek for. We need to pray for. We need to study. Amen. Paul said in 1 Corinthians, second uh, chapter in the ninth verse, 1 Corinthians 2 and 9, But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have it entered into the heart of man, the things which God hath prepared for them that love Him. Now I can stop right there and say that we can have no idea whatsoever what it's going to be like. And that's the way we usually use that Scripture. But Paul didn't stop talking there. He said, But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. You can't understand it with your carnal mind. But you can understand it through the mind of Christ. Paul said, I have not seen... Ear hath not heard. He's talking about your carnal senses. Neither has it entered into the heart, or we could say this morning, into the mind of man. Amen? The carnal mind of man. What God has in store for them that love Him. And then He says, But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things. The deep thing, He says, Yea, the deep things of God. This lets me know that the carnal mind cannot comprehend it, but your 